pound for pound, top five hand speed in the world. What's happening, everybody? Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter. I'm sorry if I caught you on your glass jaw there with that elbow. UFC picks, the fight gloves are on. UFC is going down this Saturday morning because they are all the way over in Macau. Who's Cal? Macau. I got some picks for you. Here they come. I'm going to start on the undercard. This is kind of a weird card that the way that it's put together. we got four undercard fights, and we got six main card fights. It's kind of cool to see six fights on the main card. Uh, the quality leaves a little something to be desired, but I think it's going to be a decent night of fights in any case. So we'll start on the undercard. In the welterweight division, we have David Mitchell taking on hyung Yu Lim. And get used to that, kids, because some of these names on this card is going to be a little, going to be a little iffy on the pronunciation part. Uh, David Mitchell, 11 and 2 on his pro career, he has lost both of his UFC outings by decision to Paulo Tiago as well as T.J. Waldberger. Uh, nine of his 11 professional wins have come by way of submission. David Mitchell has yet to win a round inside of the octagon. Taking on again, Hyung Yu Lim, Lim 10, 3, and 1 on his pro career, making his UFC debut, currently riding a five fight win streak. They've all been finishes, four knockouts along with one submission. Seven of his ten professional wins have come by way of knockout. He is a boxer training with Korean top team. Usually whenever it comes down to this, basically these battles between strikers and grapplers, especially between boxers and grapplers, I always, always, always lean towards the grappler side of things. Uh, this really is one of these do-or-die fights, I think, for David Mitchell. Uh, I think he's got to win this fight. If he doesn't win this fight, he's probably going to be out on his ass in terms of his job in the UFC. So I always like to go with these guys that are fighting with everything to lose. I'm going to take David Mitchell. I'm going to take David Mitchell by way of submission inside the first round. Next fight at bantamweight, we have Takeya Mitsugaki taking on Jeff Hugland. Takeya Mitsugaki, 15-7-2 on his pro career, an even record of 2-2 two two inside the octagon. He was decision in his last fight by Chris Carriazzo. Mitsugaki has really been hit and miss since... You know, back in 08, he's 4-5 and five in his last nine fights. So it's really win one, lose one, win one, lose one. Uh, five of his 15 pro wins have come by way of knockout, so he does certainly have some knockout power. Mitsugaki's biggest tool is his wrestling and his grappling. He is 9-5 and five when the fight goes the distance. Taking a look at Jeff Hugland, he is 10 and 5 on his pro career, another even record, but this time of 1 and 1 inside the octagon. He was decisioned in his last fight by Yves Jabouin, a fight that Jabouin really dominated. Uh, that loss to Jabouin snapped a 9 fight win streak for Jeff Hugland, so he was really flying high until he hit he hit uh, Jabouin. Seven of his ten professional wins have come by way of submission. He has been submitted in three of his five losses. I don't really think Hugland needs to worry too much about getting submitted in this fight. I think Mitsugaki has one submission on his career. What he really needs to watch out for, and what I really had to think about for quite some time when I was trying to put together a prediction for this fight, was does Hugland have the ability to submit off of his back? I know he's a BJJ black belt, but if you look at the record, his he does have seven submissions, but if you look at the submissions that he has, some of them are rear naked chokes. You certainly can't do that off your back. He, some of them are arm bars. You can do that off your back, but if I remember correctly, I don't think that's the way he's done them. I think he's done them from top position as opposed to being on the bottom. And he's got one guillotine choke, which I guess is possible from the bottom. But I just, I don't see him as the kind of jujitsuist really that attacks off of his back. So, I really don't see him snagging one on, on Mitsugaki and, and submitting him. I really don't. I expect Mitsugaki to take this fight down. In his four UFC fights, Mitsugaki has attempted 17 takedowns and been successful on 14 of them. So, you know, you're talking about averaging three takedowns a fight little more than three a fight. Uh, I gotta go with Mitsugaki. I think Mitsugaki's going to uh, out-grapple Hugland, and Hugland may threaten 
a little bit from the bottom, but ultimately I think Mitsugaki's going to take him down, control him, and ultimately pound him out. I think uh, I'm going to take Mitsugaki to beat Hugland by way of knockout or technical knockout inside of the second round. Moving to the middleweights, another sort of interesting battle between mid to lower tier guys. We got Ricky Fukuda taking on Tom DeBlas. Uh, Ricky Fukuda, 18 and 6 on his pro career, a losing record of 1 and 2 inside the octagon, was decisioned in his last fight by Costa Filippo. Uh, 10 of his 18 pro wins, however, have come by way of decision. He's a former middleweight champion in deep, and he is 10 and 5 when the fight goes the distance. So he has won 10. He's also been on the losing end five times. Tom DeBlas, 7-1 and one on his pro career, losing his Octagon debut in a decision loss to Cyril Diabati. Uh, four of his seven pro wins have come by way of finishes, two knockouts and two submissions. Notable about those submissions, both of them have been leg submissions. I believe one was a heel hook and one was an Achilles lock, if I remember correctly. Notable, he's fought at heavyweight and light heavyweight. So this is a this is a smaller weight class for DeBlas, but based on the way sort of his body's made up, uh, middleweight may very well be the right weight class for him, so he may feel much more natural uh, at this weight. When Tom DeBlas stepped up to fight Cyril Diabati, that represented uh, a significant step up in competition. And quite frankly, I didn't think Tom DeBlas looked all that good. I thought Diabati controlled the majority of that fight and, and you know, took home a very convincing decision. I can, I can see Ricky Fukuda doing the exact same thing. I don't see, I certainly, I don't see Fukuda finishing DeBlas because, again, that loss to Diabati was DeBlas' only blemish on his career, so obviously he's never been finished. I think I would need to see DeBlas get finished before I would say someone's going to finish him. At the same time, I need to see Tom DeBlas win at this level before I can start picking with him. I gotta go with Ricky Fukuda, the edge in UFC experience. I will take Ricky Fukuda to beat Tom DeBlas by way of unanimous judges' decision. The main event fight on the preliminary card in the flyweight division, we got the little fellas. Yasuhiro Yoroshitani, top five ranked flyweight in the world, taking on a very exciting fighter, John Lineker. This has one of those fight of the night sort of vibes around it. Uh, Yoroshitani, 19-5 and 6 on his pro career, uh, winless in the UFC, losing his UFC debut to Joseph Benavidez by way of TKO. Uh, that loss snapped a five-fight win streak for Yoroshitani outside of the UFC. 14 of his 19 professional wins have come by way of decisions, and he is a former bantamweight champion in Shudo, so he does have championship pedigree, just at a weight class slightly above the one he's fighting in now. John Lineker, 19-6 and six on his pro career, one of the most exciting fighters in the flyweight division, which says a lot. Uh, he's also winless in the UFC, losing his UFC debut by way of submission to Louis Godneau. Uh, but in that loss snapped a 13-fight winning streak outside of the UFC for John Lineker. 11 of his 19 professional wins have been finishes, but he has been submitted in all three of his losses. If you look at Lineker's fight with Godno, the first round and a half was aneurysm causing with all the action that was going on there. They were so fast and they were so explosive. I look at Yoroshitani, that's not the way really that Yoroshitani fights. All the fights that I've watched with Yoroshitani, he seems almost flat-footed, he seems very methodical. Not, It's not a knock against him, it just seems to be the way that he fights. But I think if he tries to bring that game plan against Lineker, eventually Lineker's going to catch up to him. Uh, I, I'm taking Lineker in this fight. I think Lineker... I think it does go into deep waters. I think it'll go into the third round, but I'm going to take Lineker to finish the fight in the third round by way of knockout or technical knockout. Moving on to the main card now, to the the uh, sorry, to the lightweight division. I was going to say middleweight, but it's not. Uh, Tia Trinzang, who again I lovingly love to refer to as Taekwon Zhang, uh, the Mongolian Wolf, taking on John Tuck. Uh, Zhang is 15-3 and three in his pro career, has a losing record of 1-2 and two inside the octagon. Currently riding a two-loss two streak sorry, to uh, Darren Elkins and Issa Tamora. 
He's lost three of his last four fights, those accounting for all three of his professional losses. Twelve of his 15 professional wins have come by way of submission. Fighting in front of the hometown crowd, fights with China top team. Uh, John Tuck, 6-0, and oh, undefeated on his pro career, making his UFC debut. He's finished all six of his professional fights. Three knockouts, three submissions. He's dangerous wherever the fight goes. Notable about John Tuck, he won at the 2010 World Jiu-Jitsu Cup gold and silver in two separate competitions, I believe in two separate weight classes. Or it might have been gi and no gi, I can't remember. But this guy is an extremely, extremely talented grappler uh, everywhere that it goes. And he's a grappler that's got knockout power as well, as he's displayed in three of his six MMA fights. This is an extremely difficult fight for uh, for Tietron Zong. It's, uh, it's a very difficult fight. Tuck is a very dangerous opponent. I went against the hometown crowd when I picked Dave Herman to beat Big Nog, and that did not work out. Now, Zhang is no Big Nog, but at the same time, I'm not going against the hometown crowd again. I'm going with my heart a little bit more than my head here, but I'm going to take Tietran Zhang, Taekwon Zhang, Mongolian Wolf, however you want to say it, upsetting, some may say, John Tuck by way of unanimous judge's decision. Back to the Bantamweights now. We have Motonobu Tezuka taking on Alex Bruce Leroy Caceres. Uh, Tezuka, 19-4-4 four four on his pro career, making his UFC debut. Currently riding a three-fight win streak in Pancrase. Uh, 13 of his 19 professional wins have come by way of decision. This is the first time in his career that Tezuka will be fighting outside of Japan. And three of his four... Professional losses have come by way of submission. Alex Caceres, 7-5 and five on his pro career, has a losing record of 2-3 and three inside the octagon. However, he submitted Damasio Page in his last fight. Currently has UFC wins over the aforementioned Damasio Page, as well as Cole Escovedo. Six of his seven pro wins have been finishes, but four of his five losses have come by way of submission. So again, even though Tezuka definitely has the edge in overall fight experience, uh, Leroy only has 12 fights, and Tezuka has, I believe, 27. So he's got double the ex fight experience. It's two guys with sort of very similar sort of results, you know what I mean? The majority of their losses have come by submission. Uh, I think whoever loses this fight is probably going to lose the fight by submission, uh, just based on the fact that that's the way that both of these guys seem to lose the majority of their fights. So, I'm picking a submission, and if I'm picking a submission, I have to go with Caceres. If you're betting, if you're using my picks as the basis to make bets, don't, don't bet on this fight. <laughs> I'll, I'll put it that way. Don't bet on this fight. But, I'm going to go with Caceres. I'm going with my gut. Alex Caceres, by way of submission, inside the first round. Moving up to the lightweights. I have to say, up to the lightweights. One of the fights on this card that I was looking forward to the most. The Fireball Kid, Takanori Gomi, squaring off against Mac Danzig. And I'm a huge Mac Danzig fan. Takanori Gomi, 33-8-1 on his pro career, a losing record of 2-3 and three inside the octagon. He TKO'd uh, Eiji Mitsuoka the last time out. Uh, his UFC losses have come against, he's got three UFC losses, and they've come against very high-level competition. He had that uh, submission loss to Nate Diaz, he lost to Clay Guida, and he lost to Kenny Florian. Uh, so Gomi's UFC losses are nothing to sneeze at. They're against high-level competition. Mac Danzig, 21-9-1 on his pro career, an even record of 5-5 five and five in the UFC. Decisioned Efren Escudero in his last fight. Kind of, a, he's been hit and miss a little bit since around 2010, and he's only got one finish inside the UFC in the last four years. Another fight that's very difficult to pick because I'm a huge fan of Mac Danzig and obviously a huge fan of Takanori Gomi and everything that he's done. It's so hard to pick. It really, it really was, and I'm even debating it while I'm sitting here. <laughs> Takanori Gomi, I can't even look at the camera when I do this. Takanori Gomi, unanimous judge's decision. Let's move on. In the welterweight division, we have Donghyun Stun Gun Kim taking on Paolo, I don't have a cool nickname, Tiago. 
Stun Gun Kim, 15, 2, 1, and 1 on his pro career. A very good record of 6, 2, and 1 inside the octagon. It was TKO'd in the last fight by Damian Maya. That's where he suffered that sort of freak uh, rib injury. Before his fight with Carlos Condit, which was the first fight in the UFC that he had lost, he was unbeaten in six UFC fights before running into, you know, top competition, Carlos Condit and Damian Maya. The thing about Stun Gun that bothers me, he's got no finishes since 2008. Paulo Tiago, 14 and 4 on his pro career. All four of his professional losses and four of his professional wins have come inside the UFC. Was knocked out in his last fight by, and this is another name that's going to be tough to pronounce, Bahadurzada? Bahadurzada? I think. Good. 4 and 3 when the fight goes the distance in decisions. 8 of his 14 professional wins have come by way of submission. I lovingly dub this fight the battle for welterweight judo supremacy because these are two of the finest judo practitioners in the welterweight division. Duh, Stun Gun Kim, of course, a uh, fourth fourth degree black don in judo and Paulo Tiago, I believe, is a first degree black don in judo. I gotta stick with my gut and I gotta stick with the guy that I like more. Gotta go with Stun Gun. I think Stun Gun rebounds from that sort of freak loss to Damian Maya. I thought Stun Gun had a real good chance to win that fight against Maya had that not happened. I like Stun Gun. I'm gonna take him in this fight. I'm gonna take him to get the fight to the ground and pound out a TKO victory inside the second round. Co-main event time, light heavyweight division, Tiago, I piss dirty Silva, taking on Stanislav Nedkov. Tiago Silva, 14-3-1 on his pro career, a decent record of 5-3-1 in the UFC. Uh, decisioned in his last fight by Alexander Gustafsson, that was the fight after coming back from his suspension. Due to his one-year suspension after pissing dirty after the Brandon Vera fight, uh, he has he's winless since 2009. He's got three losses and that one that was that win that was overturned to a no contest. So winless since 2009. This could be all or nothing for Tiago Silva in terms of keeping his job. Eleven of his 14 pro wins have come by way of knockout, but he is also a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. Stanislav Nedkov, uh, another guy that could very soon be given the moniker of Destroyer of Worlds alongside. Glover Teixeira. 12-0 and in his pro career, winning his UFC debut by TKOing Luis Kane. Oh, sorry. Luis Kane. How pretentious is that? Uh, in his last fight, 10 of his 12 pro wins have been finishes, 6 knockouts, 4 submissions. He's only had 3 fights since 2009. This is due to opponent injuries or apparent visa issues, things like that, but whenever he gets in there... <laughs> Those three fights, he's had more than a year between his pro fights. But again, when he gets in there, he does some pretty awesome things. Uh, even though these are two guys that are extremely well-rounded, very dangerous everywhere, very comfortable on the ground, I figure these two guys are going to come out, and they're both going to swing, and somebody's going to fall over. And I think that someone that's going to fall over is Tiago Silva. I'm going to go with Stanislav Nedkov to remain undefeated by knockout or technical knockout inside of the first round. That takes us to our main event of the evening, middleweight division, Rich Ace Franklin. Uh, I'm the young one in this fight because I'm only 38, taking on... Kung Lee. Rich Franklin, 29-6-1 on his pro career. A great record of 14-5 inside the UFC. Decisioned Vanderlei Silva last time out in their rematch. Kind of been a little hit and miss since 2007, but he's got 25 finishes in his 29 professional fights, 15 knockouts, and 10 submissions. Rich Franklin is an amazing talent. Kung Lee, 8-2 on his pro career, an even record of 1-1 one one in the UFC. Decisioned Patrick Cote in his last fight. Seven of his eight professional wins have come by way of knockout. Kung Lee is an immensely talented martial artist. 17-0, professional kickboxer with 12 knockouts. Kung Lee is extremely talented. Again, I, I mentioned when I was talking about Rich Franklin, I'm the young one in this fight because I'm 38. Franklin's 38, Kung Lee's 40. So, I mean, this, these are guys that are really pushing towards the end of their career. I, I think Rich has come out and said, you know, I, I, I want to make another run at the middleweight title, which I think would be really interesting. Uh, and he could start here with beating Kung Lee. Do I think Kung Lee, speed-wise and... Technique-wise, can he hang with Rich Franklin? And I think the answer to that is no. If Lee gets Franklin in trouble the same way Vondi got Franklin in trouble in their last fight, I think sort of the grappler in 
Franklin will take over. And if the grappler in Franklin takes over in this fight, Kung Lee's got no chance. Uh, I'm taking Rich Franklin. I'm going to take him by way of knockout or technical knockout inside the second round. With all due respect to Kung Lee, because I like him a lot, maybe that might be Kung Lee's last hurrah in the UFC. So those are the pipe picks for you guys. I'm going to go over them here with you one more time. On the prelim card, starting at welterweight, I have David Mitchell to submit uh, Hyung Yu Lim in the first round. Bantamweight, I have Takeya Mitsugaki to knock out, or technically knock out, Jeff Hugland in the second round. Middleweight, I have Ricky Fukuda to decision Tom DeBlass. And at flyweight, the main event fight from the prelim card, I have John Lineker to knock out or TKO Yasuhiro Yoroshitani in the third round. Moving to the main card, lightweight, I have uh, something of an upset. I have uh, Tia Trinzang, Taekwon Zhang, Mongolian Wolf, to decision John Tuck. At bantamweight, I have uh, Alex Caceres to submit Motonubo Tezuka in the first round. At lightweight, I have Takanori Gomi to decision Mac Danzig. At welterweight, I have Dong Hyun Kim to TKO or knock out Paulo Tiago in the second round. At light heavyweight, I have Stanislav Nedkov to remain undefeated by way of knockout or technical knockout in the first round against Tiago Silva. In main event of the evening, I have Rich Ace Franklin to knock out or technically knock out Kung Lee in the second round. Those are the fight picks. Want to see your fight picks? Fight picks, sorry, in the comments section below. Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter. Respect the hand speed.